views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hola everyone, welcome to Open BXR It's Remote, brought to you from my living workspace, Charri Executive Suites, where we continue to provide you with information regarding COVID-19, along with our New York State of Quarantine and the impact it's having on our community. I'm Rina Valentin, your host in Café Con Leche with you every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we'll speak to New York State Senator of the 33rd District, Gustavo Rivera, about antibody testing as the key to reopening the city, along with the push for rent suspensions for all New Yorkers. After that, we'll hear about the Citizens Committee of New York's City News Campaign that will help raise money for small business industry workers during this pandemic. Then we'll be joined by UPRO's Executive Director, Elizabeth Yampier, who will tell us about the impact COVID-19 is having on the environment. And later on in the show, Bobby C. brings us an up-to-date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, our open artist spotlight is violinist James Teal, whose music brings people of all backgrounds together for any occasion. And lucky for us, we'll get a taste of what this talented musician can do. So, sit back. All this and more is headed your way because now we are officially open. for the next hour, always inviting you to get social with us online, especially during these social distancing times. Uh, tweet us and follow us on Instagram at Brosnet TV and like us on Facebook at Open Brosnet Television. And of course, while you're there, follow me on Twitter, FB, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So the new antibody testing for COVID-19 determines whether a person has had COVID-19 in the past. It's also expected to help guide the reopening of the economy. And many people are still without jobs and the need for rent relief is needed now more than ever. Joining us to discuss these topics, we welcome New York State Senator of the 33rd District, Senator Gustavo Rivera. Hello, it Senator. Is, hello, it is a pleasure to see you. And 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 I, I thought that this was gonna be the case, but yes, your energy is so much, it even comes through the screen. So, oh, I appreciate uh, that. Because I, I usually I'm usually doing this in person with you, so I'm uh, I, I definitely miss being next to your level of energy. So I'm glad to at least see a little bit on the screen. Well, I appreciate that really more than you know because <laughs> yes, I I too am feeling the uh, aftermath of the social distancing. As you know, I am a people person. I love mm -hmm. being around people. I also happen to be an affectionate person. Uh, and so, you know, if we were in each other's presence, you know, I would be giving you a hug, even though you're a senator yes, and the formalities are to <laughs> shake hands. But, you know, it's all about affection. And, and so thank you. Thank you for for say, stating that yeah. it's uh, it's radiating through our uh, what a video conferencing. <laughs> yes. The future. We're in the future right now. It is. It okay. appears so. So, uh, Senator Gustavo Rivera, yep. let's open up with just sharing with everyone. Uh, the, uh, the initiative that I think uh, really brought us, uh, became, uh, allowed us to become more familiar with each other. And that was the Bronx Can Initiative in mm -hmm. which you were one of the spearheads, right? You spearheaded yeah. that together with the Bronx Borough President. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to open up with that is because um, based on your current position of being the um, the co-chair, right? You're, the chair of the health committee in the Senate. Yeah, the chair of the health committee. In the yes, mm -hmm. And so tell me how one led to the other and where we are now in the Bronx. Well, so, so back in 2011, uh, we I, I launched a, the, what you're referring to as the Bronx Can Health Initiative, which was a uh, the goal was to really talk about some of the healthcare disparities that existed in the Bronx and have existed uh, not just in the Bronx, but in communities of color across the state and the country. But we wanted to focus right here in our home borough. 
And it was to talk about the disparities that existed uh, and talk about some of the things that we could do individually, but then talk about the things that we could that we needed to do structurally to change to actually make uh, people's lives healthier and better. Um, and the reason why that's so essential to understand is that this was back in 2011, right? There's an organization that's called the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's a think tank that does public health ratings. Uh, and for something like nine years in a row, I believe 10 years in a row, the Bronx has actually ranked lowest uh, in, in the, all sorts of indices related to health. And so as it relates to our current situation, you know, many of us were not surprised. Uh, we were, it was, we're heartbroken, but we're not surprised that some of the deaths, most of the deaths have occurred in communities of color and the rates of, of death and infection have been much higher in communities that have lacked access to affordable and uh, quality healthcare. This is not a surprise. Uh, so talking about these healthcare disparities, the, the, goal, the goal was always to, th to say, these are things that are happening that have uh, that are long-term things that we need to address and we need to face them and what this crisis has brought more in focus is the absolute necessity to actually not just talk about them but actually do something about them and really invest real resources to be able to turn back uh, these healthcare disparities because we see when a situation like this happens the we get the worst of it and that's what's right. uh, particularly painful and so, yeah, and so since becoming the chair of the uh, New York State uh, Senate's Health Committee, what kind of policies have you implemented to uh, assist, especially where we are right now, yeah. this pandemic crisis? Well, there, there's, there's a lot of small and, 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 and medium-sized things that I have been working on since uh, the, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, the health committee, there's a lot of uh, small and medium policy changes that need to be done to our public health system, which are which are which is very complicated. But there's one thing that I have been focused on, and now I'm going to double down on, and that is to pass the New York Health Act. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that I've sponsored for the last couple of years, and it seeks to establish a single payer system in the state of New York. Now, what this means simply is guaranteeing universal access to health care to every single person who is a New Yorker, regardless of their age, their wealth, their immigration status. <clears throat> we believe that healthcare is a human right. And this crisis right now demonstrates so clearly that the system that we've had, the idea that your job is the one thing that connects to what type of healthcare you have access to. And it's not just whether you're employed or not, it's whether you're employed in the right job the notion that that's how we're going to be, that that's how we should go forward is nuts. I mean, we see what happens right now. There's literally millions of people across the country who overnight, through no fault of their own, have lost their jobs, therefore have lost access to health care. We need to go in a different direction. And the New York Health Act uh, is the way to do it. So what I have been pursuing for the last couple of years, I'm going to double down on. We need to secure universal access to people. And the New York Health Act is the way to do that. So with regards to the antibody testing that yep. is occurring right now, do people need health insurance for that? Well, it, right now, the, as, as I understand it, no. Uh, the problem is that, you know, I'll, I'll, there's somebody that I know personally whose sister, and, and thank God, her sister is good now. Her sister was in, is in her 30s, um, healthy, young. She caught coronavirus. She was on an intub she was intubated. Uh, with a vent for the ventilator with about for about two weeks but she came out of it she's recuperating she is back home but now the bills have started to arrive and we just i just got a picture of somebody sent me seventy five thousand dollars oh my goodness seventy five thousand dollars they owe the hospital now and this is a person who is insured so as far as the antibody test is concerned so, so we should talk about a couple of different things as far as the antibody test one thing that i want to make sure that i tell everyone just because you're getting an antibody test does not mean that you're immune, okay? We do not have enough evidence to determine that. It is important that we get the antibody test done because there are two different types of tests. The diagnostic test, which determines whether you have the, the virus or not, and the antibody test, which determines if you had the virus and have now survived it. Uh, but the problem is that there's different strains of this virus that there's a lot of false positives, which means that you might get a test and it might not necessarily be accurate. So this is not 
a, a license for you to say, hey, I'm, I'm immune, I can go and do whatever I want. We need that information to be able to reopen because we need to track it. We need to know who has the disease and who's had the disease. Um, but, you know, so, so the antibody test is important, uh, but it does, not, it does not mean that you are immune. And whether it's going to be covered by insurance for the moment, you should be able to get it. But insurance companies uh, have a way of changing the rules on you. Uh, and so I, I, I'm really concerned about relying on a system in the long term in which insurance companies are in the middle of. So, OK, well, thank you, because you just summed it all up with regards to the importance of getting tested, both for the coronavirus as well as the antibody yeah. and the reopening of our economy. Um, but before we go, I want uh, to mention the um, the insulin uh, bill that you were, you were also yeah. passing, right? Because you're really trying to assist our community in, in a way that we really shouldn't be concerning ourselves with finances. And there's mm -hmm. also the uh, issue of... Um, the rent uh, strike. I mean, you know, I mean, not the rent strike, but how about no. let's just skip on rent. <laughs> so there's a there's so there's there's a lot there, right? To talk about rent for a second, uh, it is essential that we cancel rent. There's a couple of different pieces of legislation that we're looking at right now. Although the governor could actually do a lot of this through uh, direct action, he seems to insist that he has already taken care of it, that he has, uh, because there is a 90 day moratorium that we're in the middle of right now, that nobody can get evicted during those 90 days. But we're already seeing, I'm already dealing with constituents who are getting letters from their landlord saying, at, you know, when the 90 days are up, I'm coming after you. And they wrote it in a letter. So we need to go in a different direction. There's many people, millions of people who cannot pay their rent because they don't have a job because they can't go to work right now for their own safety and for the safety of others. So we cannot pressure them. We need to change that. We need to cancel the rent. And as it relates to the insulin bill really quickly, uh, it is a bill that I pass, it is a, it, it, I've passed a version of this bill in the budget. And what it does, it caps the amount that somebody was would pay on a monthly basis for a type of insulin. Right now we capped it at $100, which is a good move, but we need to go to $30. Some diabetics use different types of insulin every month. And if we don't cap each type of them, you know, each type of medicine, each type of insulin, they might go to $100, $200, $300 a month. So in, in a moment like this, where particularly with just this is a life sustaining medication, we need to secure access to it. So that's kind of, of some of the things that I've been working on. That's a bill that I introduced to cap it at 30 per type of insulin. Okay. And so <clears throat> in closing, I'm just going to mention to everyone that, um, you also offer this employment bulletin yep. that um, is available by, uh, I guess, reaching out to you. Yep. If you go, uh, we, we put out a, an employment bulletin. We've done it in the past. This is a special edition, so to speak, uh, which has resources for people that are seeking unemployment benefits. And I know it is difficult right now, but we are here to assist you. Uh, you can contact my office. Uh, if you contact me by email, G Rivera at nysenate.gov, and I'm hoping that it's underneath us at this moment. Uh, if you send us an email right there, we will send you the employment bulletin, which will include not only information about unemployment benefits, but also some opportunities for some, uh, for some places that are hiring during this time, right? So that, that is all in the employment bulletin. And my office, which is also the number should be right here, 718 933 2034. My office continues to be open. We are virtually open and helping constituents every single day. Let us know about the issues that you have with your landlord. We'll try to help with unemployment, um, you know, resources for if you lack food access, we can help with that. Access for your for teaching your kid at home. We're providing all this assistance virtually. So please be in contact with us and realize that we're, we're, I'm still here to serve you. My staff is still here to serve you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustavo Rivera. You guys, once again, for more on Senator Gustavo's employment bulletin and the resources, you can visit grivera at nysenate.gov. And also you can call 718-933-2034. Follow him on Instagram and Twitter at nysenatorrivera. All right. We have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll uh, hear about a new campaign that's going to help small business industry owners. Don't go anywhere. <music> Hey everyone, welcome back to our remote version of Open. 
So since the 1970s, the Citizens Committee for New York City continues to be the nation's oldest microfunding organization that raises money from foundations, corporations, and individual donors to award special projects. They are the lead organization supporting grassroots groups dedicated to improving the quality of life in low income neighborhoods. And so the Citizens Committee is currently focusing on uh, small business industry workers uh, during this pandemic crisis with a new social media campaign called uh, hashtag at their service. And here to share more, we welcome Citizens Committee for New York City CEO, Dr. Hassan Harris, who just took on this position. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here, and I, let's just share with everyone the joke. So we've had you on open in the past, and at the time, you were the CEO of the Emma Bowen Foundation, uh, which is kind of like an arm or uh, connected to NBC, right? You were in the field of media, and now you've taken on this role as CEO of committee uh, for uh, the Citizens Committee for New York City, uh, which for me, sounds like uh, a lot of field work. Mm. And um, bueno, you took on this role right when we were being told to pause. Exactly. Um, so Citizens Committee for New York is uh, been around, like you said, since 1975. It was created, interestingly, in a time of crisis. Um, for those who were around in New York City, the federal government basically told New York City to go to hell. Um, the city uh, government was bankrupt. They didn't have money to pay their employees. And um, Jacob Javits, you know, Jacob Javits and the Javits Center, the right. Republican senator, and Osborne Elliott, who was the founder of Newsweek, they came together separate sides of the political aisle, but said, we love New York City. And we're going to be all in to make sure that the city is improved and is there for everyone. So it was during that crisis that we were founded. And interestingly enough, my first day was the first day that New York City had its current crisis. That's because of COVID. Oh um, my I gosh. haven't even started uh, with my staff um, in person. We've had not had an in-person office meeting since I've started. Everything's been through Zoom and over Slack. And it's just been incredible. Um, I just want to say, though, it's an honor to be able to lead at this moment when New York City needs everyone to be all in. And so that's why I'm really excited that you have us here on Open and um, just really appreciate what you're doing for the Bronx and for all of New York City. Well, absolutely. And I, I got to say, you were really thrown into the fire. <laughs> absolutely. As, but you know what, though? Um, I think sometimes folks learn by being thrown into the deep end of the pool, sink or swim. And we're definitely swimming. And I think all New Yorkers right now are in that moment, and it's important for us that can provide life preservers, so to speak, to make right. sure that everyone can be okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good term. That's a good reference because uh, I, I want uh, people to learn a little bit more about the Citizens Committee for New York City because um, it, it's not uh, an organization that does handouts. It's an organization that galvanizes communities to be able to preserve themselves. And so um, I, I understand that there's a distribution that happens throughout the five boroughs. And so can you talk a little bit about how the funding is raised and how it's distributed? No, yeah, that's a great question. So to be extremely, hopefully simple and clear, our mission is to um, help bring New York City citizens together, New Yorkers together to improve the city. And we're most excited when we bring folks in the most vulnerable communities together to improve the city. So as you said, it's not a handout. It's really providing opportunities for community leaders to make the improvements and the changes that they've identified. So we've given out small grants historically. Um, last year, for example, we gave out approximately 600 grants for approximately $2,000 each uh, across the five boroughs. So that's helping block associations, that's helping after school programs, that's helping uh, organizations that are working with you know, um, immigrants to help them solve the problems that they have identified. How do we raise that money? We raise that money by primarily we have this one huge dinner that thank God took place in February before the whole city was on lockdown. And this year's dinner raised uh, approximately $1.5 million 
that goes into our you know, coffers to help us give that money out across the city. What we've done um, in the past, we've given a lot of grants that help out all those projects that I've said before, community gardens, after school programs and the sort. And right now we're pivoting because we recognize that basic needs aren't being met uh, in this time of COVID. People are losing their jobs. Folks are having difficult time finding food because the grocery stores and the places where they get them are closed down. You know, folks' mental health and their physical health, you know, sometimes they're in question and definitely our elders need more support. And so we're focusing our efforts right now to make sure that we're taking care of those basic needs so that all New Yorkers can thrive. Right, which leads us to the new campaign that you're about to launch, and it's geared more towards small businesses uh, as well as industrial workers. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so at their service, um, so here's the secret. You're hearing it first. I was talking to one of our board members, and they said, you know, we want to do something uh, that helps some folks that have been helping us the whole while. And she, like, put her hand through her hair and she's like, I haven't had my hair done in a long time and I don't know when I'm going to be able to go to my salon. And, you know, that might seem um, like a little bit, you know, put on and it doesn't make you happy that you don't necessarily look your best, but imagine the person that owns a salon or the barbers or the folks that um, are dry cleaning clothes because we're not going out to work the same way. You know, people who are your trainers at gyms, you know, those are folks that are, you know, at your service um, on a regular basis, helping you look good. And we wanted to make sure that we collected funds um, that help small businesses and employees that work in some of these hourly wage jobs to make sure we can be at their service. So we're starting this hashtag, hashtag at their service. And this campaign will definitely be going through the month of May. We're trying to raise uh, $30,000 um, to be able to put into the small business fund that we're doing. And I'll speak briefly about that. Um, our initiative around COVID has three components, but one of them is small business assistance. We're starting with this one fund that we're able to start in the, through the Hudson Yards project, um, the West Side Community Fund. Uh, we started a fund giving out, um, right now the fund's at, uh, I think, $180,000 that we're giving out to small businesses there. We're prioritizing person of color and immigrant um, led businesses because many of those folks didn't get access to capital from their banks or from the federal response to PPP. You might've heard that right, some, right, yeah, right. some of the so larger what, what, companies what are the, what, got what are the, the, Some of the, um, what's the process for them to access that or even qualify for that? Yeah. So well, let me talk about the federal response first. You know, you, you had to be in the know, you had to know where the website was. You had to, have a relationship with your bank and then your bank had to be able to process it quickly enough to get it to the small business alliance and a lot of um businesses of color you know are partially organized and have some relationships but unfortunately just looking at the data they're rejected for loans more often than their white counterparts they don't have access to banks the same way their white counterparts have and especially if you have a different like immigration status like you're new um you don't necessarily know those networks to get access to that money. And in particular for the federal response, um, the Paycheck Protection Program, you had to get in fast. The ones that got in fast got their, you know, in line to get that funding. So if you don't have those relationships, you don't have the speed to work quickly. So our process is one, yes, you have to find our website, but we're going through um, local politicians and going through our mailing list um, for the area that we're doing. But we're also prioritizing folks that didn't get the funding and folks that might have been missed over. So the things that might have been, you know, an impediment or disadvantage in the other process, we're making sure that we're looking at you first for our process because we want to make sure that this is equitable and every business and every person, no matter what background you have, um, has a chance. So we're starting in Chelsea, but as we grow our fund, we're, we're looking to raise $500,000 so that businesses from all across the five boroughs can apply. And so what website would they go to to begin applying to register? So they can go to citizenscommittee.org, I'm sorry, citizensnyc.org backslash grants, or they just go to citizenscommittee.org and navigate our website and you'll be able to find out how to get on our mailing list and also where, where they can apply.
Well, um, I do thank you for sharing this knowledge uh, for those who are in need and also for making it fun um, because, again, we're back to the uh, at their service campaign, which is launching. And um, I, I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that the idea behind the hashtag is not only to, of course, uh, participate, but to make a donation in, in the form of what you would normally pay to get a haircut and or get your nails done and uh, whatever that service is. It's so that it goes into a pot that you guys are gonna distribute to those industry workers. Absolutely, and we're just really, you know, happy to be at service to people who are service to us. And thank you, La Reina, for helping us to get the word out to the community because a lot of folks from our community work in those industries. And so if we support them, then we're supporting their families and the community writ large. And that's what we want to do. Beautiful, beautiful. We're all in this together. Thank you so much, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> gracias, <laughs> muchísimas gracias, muy amable. <laughs> de nada, de nada, de nada, de nada, de nada. Awesome. Oh, gosh. So, uh, once again, you guys, to participate in the hashtag at their service campaign for small business industry workers, you can uh, post your gray hairs, your DIY, uh, DIY, uh, DIY, excuse me, haircuts, you know, the do it yourself, and uh, chip nails, which I'm probably going to post. And <laughs> make sure you tag Citizen on Instagram. And of course, they're at Citizens Committee. Um, at, that's on Instagram and hashtag at their service. Okay. We have to take a quick break, but uh, when we return, we'll discuss the COVID-19, um, more on the COVID-19, I should say, and the effects it's having on the environment. Don't go anywhere. Hey, welcome back to Open Remote. So COVID-19 has impacted people and the economy, but it's also impacted the environment. And our next guest is a lead advocate for climate justice and the executive director for Uprose Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based intergenerational and multiracial organization uh, that uh, exercises sustainability and resiliency. She's been recognized by Vogue as a climate warrior, and um, she's here to tell us about Uprose and her initiative, uh, hashtag Our Power PR. NYC, along with current environmental issues. Please welcome Elizabeth Ian Pierre. Hi. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an thank honor to be here. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And um, blessings to you on your recovery. Thank you, Ashe. Yeah. Thank you. It was I, rough. <laughs> um, I think, no, I mean, it, it's, uh, these are some really, uh, uncertain times that we're dealing with. And right now, I think everyone is basing their, uh, their feelings and their emotions on what the media is uh, providing as information. And I think at this point, the fear is that everybody's just going to end up hospitalized, yet you were able to recover in your home, on your own. <laughs> I was. Um, I, I think people forget sometimes that those of us who are were born and raised in the communities that we serve, that run community organizations, are also personally impacted. And um, I lost uh, four members of my family. My son lost two friends. Um, and um, we all got COVID at home. And I was probably the one who was most impacted because of my underlying health conditions. Um, and... Uh, and it was pretty scary. It lasted for, for weeks. Um, I was able to measure uh, my oxygen levels and my pulse. And there was a day where my pulse was 224. Like I was short of going into cardiac arrest. I didn't want to go to the hospital because I felt that I would die there. Um, and I did things that I thought uh, that I learned later were the right things to do, like turning on my side. Uh, I took lots of showers to bring down the fever, um, just a lot of things. I prayed a lot um, and I was terrified. And I think that I'm a little bit traumatized. People don't talk about the mental health issues that we're enduring as a result of, of this experience of not only being fragile in the midst of all of it, but also being surrounded by sirens going on 24 seven and losing, losing loved ones. I was born and raised in an EJ community, an environmental justice community. And so it wasn't surprising that those communities that have been most impacted all over the United States are people of African and indigenous ancestry. Those are the people suffering from asthma, upper respiratory disease and diabetes, which is related to environmental uh, burdens. 
So, um, so yeah, I, 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 but I'm good. I'm good now, but thank you so much for asking. I'm, I'm happy to share the experience. Uh, if it, if it lifts people and it makes them feel like they're going to make it through. Well, thank you. And thank you for being so transparent about it and open because at the end of the day, the idea of environmental justice is it really, it serves in, in various forms. Like to just share with everyone a little bit uh, about Uprose and the work that you guys are doing, because I love the fact that you're intergenerational, you're a multiracial and that the, the idea is to exercise resilience. Yeah. So we're a women of color led intergenerational organization, which means that um, we believe that leadership is a continuum and that we are more leaderful and more powerful when different generations are working with each other and learning and building across the table. So we have young people on our board, on our staff. We don't have like a youth program. We've sent four young people to Antarctica on scientific expeditions and three to the North Pole. We organize the largest gathering of young people of color on climate change in the country. Um, and we work at the intersection of, of, of racial justice and climate change. Uh, we started doing environmental justice back in 1996 when we realized that we couldn't fight for housing, for employment, for social justice if we couldn't breathe. And that our communities were the ones that were really suffering health disparities as a result of environmental racism. And we've evolved since then. We've learned a lot of new things. We just launched the first community-owned solar uh, cooperative in the state of New York. Um, and um, without knowing, how do you create something like that? What does the financing look like? We're just fearless about that. And really sort of surround ourselves with people who can provide us with the information that we need so that we could do unconventional things because we're living in unconventional times. So that's wonderful. That's a great segue into our power or hashtag our power PR NYC, because um, right now Puerto Rico is really on the brinks of having no choice but to figure out how to sustain itself. Yeah. So so uh, our power uh, PR NYC grew out of a national campaign. Uh, through the Climate Justice Alliance, because we were talking about what a just recovery would look like for frontline communities that were vulnerable to extreme weather events and climate change. And there had been a disaster in Houston, and that language comes out of there. And then when Puerto Rico was hit, I uh, was co-chair of the CJA, and uh, I'm Puerto Rican. Uprose was founded by Puerto Ricans in 1966, and I couldn't neglect Puerto Rico. We came up with the idea of how do we, as diaspora Ricans, support the front line, not supplant leadership, not duplicate the work, not helicoptering with solutions, but how do we support the people on the ground in a way that is strategic and honors their leadership and their brilliance? And so the whole concept came, we call it a just recovery, a people to people just recovery. So Puerto Rico really is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, not only is it dealing with the impact of colonialism and, you know, when we talk about climate justice, we're talking about the people who have suffered from extraction, colonialism and slavery. Puerto Rico is a model of that. And so what you're seeing right now is how capitalism has shown up and it's shown up through climate change. Uh, all of these physical and structural impacts are a result of exploitation over time. And so, uh, so right. it's not- Right, I mean, we just had earthquakes uh, this exactly. past Saturday. And exactly. Are, are those earthquakes really natural? Uh, so, so people are saying, and I don't know, I'm not a scientist, I'm an organizer, but people are saying, well, these earthquakes have nothing to do with climate change. But if you've got a tiny island that was hit by a Cat 5 hurricane, um, I would think that it would shake the foundation of a little island like that and that it could cause that kind of seismic activity. Um, also, there's a lot of development and a lot of infrastructure in Puerto Rico uh, that is not sustainable that has been created by U.S. corporations, that there are 23 super funds in Puerto Rico, toxic lands that, that when hit by a Cat 5 hurricane disperses and becomes uh, toxics that are in, in toxicants that are in the land, in the air, in the water. Um, so it is, it is really a situation that is a lot more uh, challenging than anybody can imagine. But what I can say that's positive is that the people in Puerto Rico have the solutions and that it's our responsibility to support them in, in operationalizing those. And so how has becoming co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance uh, assisted with all of your endeavors? Because you, you have your hands in, in a lot of places. Well, you know, I, I've been playing, uh, I've been very blessed to be in positions of leadership for a while. You know, I was chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council of EPA, the first Latina to do that. And I've been doing a lot of 
the CJA was just a really great opportunity because it's a national alliance of frontline organizations that stand in solidarity with each other, share resources, share strategy. Uh, and so that each community is benefits from the brain trust of the collective. And a lot of our organizations are, our communities are affected in the same way, whether it's Detroit, uh, whether it's Indian country and Indian reservations, whether it's communities that are Appalachian, whether it's the Gulf South, all of us are threatened because of extreme weather events that we didn't contribute to creating. Uh, people of color actually live within their carbon footprint. So uh, this is the results of literally extraction. And extraction is always defined as fossil fuel. But for me, it's also distraction of our extraction of our labor. Uh, right. You know, and, and also people think that climate change just started and environmental justice. But this started in the this started in the in, in the slave cabins. You know, when people were denied health and, and food and the kinds of things that sustain life. It kind of is sort of indirectly in, in repeating itself. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. so, and, and you just mentioned like the Navajo reservation is really being hit hard with, with absolutely. this, this uh, COVID-19. And so uh, in closing, can you just share with everyone the impact you feel it's had on the environment as well as the air quality? So one of the things that we've heard about COVID is that it, it, it can be carried in pollution. And so in, in EJ communities, whether it's the South Bronx, Red Hook, Sunset Park, the Lower East Side, uh, the communities that have all the power plants, the waste transfer stations, a lot of the polluting infrastructure, those are the communities that have a historic uh, profile of, of, of health disparities. And so it is carried in the PM 2.5, the, the fine particulate matter. Uh, and so we are breathing that stuff in and are more likely to be impacted, not just because of historical neglect, but also because our communities are saturated with pollution. Um, so it is completely connected. And for us, it wasn't a surprise uh, that it was our communities that would be hit the hardest. Um, so, um, but it was... So yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No. No. I. It, it, yeah. It's. It's wonderful that we're even having this discussion. And so, in in closing, I, I think it's important that our people understand the importance of of just being woke, you know, and understanding that this. Um, nobody's saying that it's anybody's fault of, in in your upbringing or whatever, but there's a sense of prevention that could be exercised. And so, I believe you guys offer this level of education. Yeah, and not just us. So you guys are in the Bronx, and in the Bronx, you've got the point, you've got Nos Quedamos, you've got, uh, you know, you've got YMPJ, there are organizations that are environmental justice organizations that have been working uh, to make the Bronx cleaner and healthier. In Brooklyn, it's Abros, it's El Puente, you know, we are members of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and we aren't just coming up with local solutions. We're also pushing for citywide legislation and have been successful in pushing citywide legislation to make our communities more breathable and healthier. The problem and the downside, and this will be another program, is how our our amenities and the victories that we've had have, lent, le have led to the gentrification of our communities, right? It's almost like we can only afford to live there uh, when they are toxic, when they're polluting, when they harm our health, uh, which is a fundamental injustice. It almost just disencourages people from, um, from fighting for cleaner air. But we have to fight for it because uh, it's, it, we, uh, you know, we're talking about a legacy and generations of people just growing up with asthma. Uh, with not being able to breathe. And Puerto Rico, as far as I know, leads in the world in terms of the number of people with asthma per capita. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, right now, that's actually what's being challenged is our, our breath of air, our, yes. our, our, our breath to, to breathe freely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but we fight. We fight. We're warriors. That's you know? what you are. We're <laughs> so happy to have you here. <laughs> Yes, leading the way in our climate fight. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the time uh, that you were able to share with us and the information that you provided. Uh, climate warrior Elizabeth Yampierre, Elizabeth who's also the executive director of Uprose. And um, I just love how you just spread it. You, you, you're, you're really putting it out there for everyone to just get a piece of the uh, information and, and really become a collective in this fight against being a stand for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be on your show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I'm so happy that you recovered. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. And uh, once again, you guys, for more uh, information on uh, climate justice, you can visit uprose.org.
All right, so don't go anywhere because Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next. Folks, we welcome in CBS Sports, NFL, and College Hoops leading voice, Spiro Diaz. Spiro, how's life on the West Coast? How are you? You know, we're, we're hanging in. We're, um, you know, we're just kind of rolling with the punches like everyone else, hunkered down at the house, uh, trying not to get fat, trying not to drink too much, uh, too much wine and uh, stay in shape. But, you know, all things considered, we're, we're hanging in. Everyone's healthy and, and okay. So thank God for that. I wanted to have you on the show, Spiro, because to me, you are kind of like the uh, LeBron James of sports broadcasting because you are a phenom at such a very, very young age. And I, I look back on your career and I think of the national exposure already at the age of 24 doing the Olympics. Just uh, for you now that you've been able to progress, of course, with CBS and do so many NFL games and, and just amazing coverage of March Madness. For you, what has this experience been like? Do you look back and pinch yourself now all these years later? Well, first of all, I mean, you're, you're too kind with that analogy, but, you know, it's, it's been, I've had such a charmed life in, in my career so far. And to have some of the opportunities I've had, you know, to call NBA finals and work for the Lakers and work for the Knicks, which literally was my dream job, you know, dreaming of one day sitting in Marv or Mike Breen's seat at the Garden and to then have that opportunity. You know, I've lived... I've lived like 10 broadcasting lives with all the luck and the good fortune that I've had. So I, I try to remind myself of that. I think this, you know, everything we're going through now is a good opportunity for all of us to kind of, you know, appreciate where we are in life, no matter what level, uh, and really kind of focus on what's important. Family, doing something you love for those of us that are fortunate to do that, and just having a, a greater appreciation for life in general. So you hit the ground running coming right out of Fordham in terms of calling games and then like you said i think the big break has got to be it got to be working with the lakers in 2005 that experience must have been amazing I mean, you're only 25 years old and you're around such great players like kobe bryant i'll never forget walking onto the team plane for my first lakers road trip we were going to san antonio uh november of 2005 and stepping onto the plane first person i see to my left is kobe First person to my right I see is Phil Jackson. And I could just remember like almost having a panic attack. You know, I had to pinch myself literally, like, you know, where am I? You know, a couple of months ago I was living with my parents in Paramus, New Jersey, and suddenly I'm, you know, the radio voice of this iconic franchise. And it was the first of many of those kind of surreal moments and you know, six of the greatest years of my life, not just work-wise, but to, to be there, uh, to live in a new city, such an amazing part of the country, Amazing, amazing, and, you know, hopefully uh, the good memories and good fortune will continue. Now, Mike Breen, another Fordham and WFUV alum, was extremely emotional, of course, on the MSG broadcast following the passing of Kobe Bryant. I'm sure that those feelings very much the same for you. 2020 has not been a good year for the world, let alone the sports world. How has this emotion been for you thinking back about the late, great Kobe Bryant? Yeah, you know, it still doesn't seem real, to be honest with you. Uh, I've thought about that morning, you know, when we all saw the news. And, you know, it's it's kind of like everyone's, you know, of our modern generation, like the JFK moment. Like, I don't think any of us will forget where we were when we found out. And for those of us who were fortunate enough to be around him and to get to know him personally, uh, you know, it's funny with Kobe, he was one way as a player, driven, you know, kind of moody, to be honest with you, there, where there were some days you knew not to approach him. But to see kind of the guy and the, the man that he became in his post-playing career, that's what I think made it even more difficult. And he, he seemed to be so content to finally get past his playing career and get to a point where he was able to finally devote his, himself to his family, his wife and his four daughters. Um, just just soul crushing, you know, and, and obviously the seven others, <clears throat> excuse me, whose lives were lost. Uh, you know, the more we got to know who they were as people, it was a tragedy and is a tragedy on, on so many levels. Talk about two iconic franchises, too, for you at that point in your life, because you get a chance to work with the Lakers and kind of follow in the, in the footsteps of Chick Hearn and then back in New York at the place that, you, you know, and the place that you want to be working with the Knicks. What was that experience like? 
it, it was interesting to go from the Lakers, you know, iconic franchise at, at a championship level and then join the Knicks. Granted, the history, you know, we know about Madison Square Garden, but a franchise that was really, really struggling to find themselves. And then suddenly this kid, Jeremy Lin, comes out of complete obscurity. I mean, we didn't know much about him, certainly, when he arrived. And all of a sudden, he becomes the prince of the city overnight. And for me, you know, Bobby, growing up in northern New Jersey, I was such a diehard Knicks fan. I remember what it was like, you know, in the Patrick Ewing days and the Oak and the Starks and Riley, what it was like to walk into the garden when they were a perennial championship contending team. The energy and the noise, like such a unique sound in that building that is incomparable. We've been to every arena in the league, lucky enough to have called games in every arena. Nothing has ever compared to that. And, when, you know, when Linsanity was happening, it was just so cool to see – get a little taste of what it was like in the 90s when the team was so great. And it, it was just amazing to see the, seat, the city get swept up in it um, and to be there and have a front row seat next to Mike Breen, who you mentioned, who's, who's one of my all-time heroes, was just, uh, you know, one of those great moments. I know it wasn't an easy decision for you, having known you now as, as a friend, to leave the Knicks in 2011, but you move on to CBS and, and again, just surrounded by so many greats in the world of broadcasting, basically be, you know, following Vern Lundquist at yeah, CBS. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool place to be. How, how has it been working there and how much do you love really working on the NFL and March Madness, especially, I know college basketball is one of your loves. You know, it's funny, every summer we gather with all the CBS announcers, um, to, to kind of have our broadcast seminars. We get ready for the NFL season. And, you know, you look around the room and there's Kevin Harlan, you know, there's Jim Nance, Ian Eagle, who's another hero of mine and has been a mentor over the years. Uh, Greg Gumbel, you know, a who's who, literally like five Hall of Fame broadcasters, Brad Nessler, the list just goes on and on. So to know that I'm part of that group, you know, in some small way, is kind of the low man on the totem pole is, um, is one of the great honors, you know, and now to be able to, have been there full time since 14. I've had a chance to build a relationship with some of these guys that I grew up watching, like I'm sure you did. And uh, it's just really the, the part of the, the neatness and the uniqueness of, of being in this business now for, you know, my God, going on 23, 24 years. Another great broadcast I would love to hear more about from you, since you are his very last pupil, is the late, great Marty Glickman. He started at FUV and he's had, you know, it had, had the impact on people like Bob Papa and, of course, yourself before he passed away in 2001. He's on the Mount Rushmore of, of the all-time, really, titans of the industry, was basically Marv Albert, you know, before Marv became who he was. Um, and so to have Marty come in and do those workshops every Wednesday, you know, up in the third floor of Keating Hall, was, for us, it, it was just, it was unbelievable, you know, and Marty was the first person who pulled me aside and and basically told me that, you know, I think that you really have a chance to make it in this business. And it was the first kind of shot of confidence that I had at that stage of my career. We'd all put our tape in one at a time and he'd listen to it in, the, in front of the whole group and he'd let you have it, you know, and it, to the point where, you know, it may have hurt you initially, but it really made you work at your craft and understand where you had to improve and get better. Can you see yourself working as long as Vince Scully in the business, Spiro? I would love it. You know, I mean, he's to, to consider how lucid Vince still was, you know, at the age of 80 plus, um, just a testament to, to who he is and how, I mean, the all time greatest sports broadcaster, I think no matter what the sport, I don't think that's pretty, you know, even disputable at this point. But, um, you know, my statistician with the Lakers, a man by the name of Doug Mann, was Vin Scully's stat man for, for a long time, over 20 years doing Dodgers TV. And when I got the Lakers job, he facilitated the meeting. So he invited me to go to Dodger Stadium and to visit with Vin in the pregame booth before the game. And of course, I'm thinking, you know, Vin's getting ready for a broadcast. They're going to just kind of move me in and out. It'll be a quick handshake and off I'll go. Vin sat me down, put his hand on my shoulder, proceeded to tell me his entire story of what it was like to move from Brooklyn to L.A., way back in the 50s, gave me advice on, you know, where I should live in the city, you know, things to look out for. I, I walked out of there. I, I was so blown away, Bobby, by by who he was as a person and to, to take that time to spend with me. Uh, you know, the reason why Vince Scully is so great is not just because he's, a, he's an iconic broadcaster. He's an even better person. And I think it was another lesson learned for me 
of how you treat people, no matter what level you're at in this business and, you know, generally how it should be in life. Well, Spiro, I can't wait to see you at an NFL stadium or back doing some college basketball. And I'll always dress up whenever you're around. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you look good. You look good, Bob. It's good to see your face. So are you. Oh, this is fun. Always good to talk to you. Welcome back to Open Remote. Our last guest has been playing the violin since he was 10 years old from playing at family holiday parties, weddings, funerals, and orchestras. His passion for music has clear, has always been clear, right? Uh, he joins all walks of life together for many occasions. Please welcome James Teal. Hi, James. Hi, Rena. How are you? I'm okay. How are you during these times? I'm, well, I'm trying to stay afloat, you know, as best I can. I get it. You know, as an artist, these are really challenging times. And based on the services that you offer, uh, please do share. How have you been uh, keeping afloat? So I've been, you know, I usually play weddings, dinners, some, the occasional you know, funeral. Um, but during these times, since everything is basically postponed until further notice, um, I, I stay busy with, um, learning new music and coming across people doing their own thing online and seeing how I can take it and do it my own way to, you know, to create to, what, like social distancing art. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To post things on my Instagram and on my TikTok. Cause you know, now there's TikTok. <laughs> Yeah, and, everything's TikTok now, right? Exactly. Right. And I'm trying to take and keep my family involved in all of this. So sometimes I'll go live and keep my family and friends entertained with, you know, some random serenades here and there. So where where is your family and where was the last time you saw your family? So I have um, most of my family, like 95% of my family is in Florida, Central Florida, Orlando and Kissimmee. And um, I still have a few aunts and uncles in um, Puerto Rico, so. And everybody's well? Everybody is well, thank God, yeah. yeah. So nothing too bad over there. Um, the only bad that happened was here in New York when I actually got the coronavirus, but that was over a month ago, so. Well, um, blessings to you on your recovery. Yeah, so I'm well now, though. It's, it's been over a month. That's wonderful, um, and and um, blessings to you. I, I can't say that enough because uh, the 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 virus itself, it's just having a it, it has a different toll. Uh, it takes a different toll on each individual. So I'm always excited when I hear somebody's recovered from it. And so based on that recovery, um, let's talk a little bit about what you do for a living because I know these are challenging times for artists. And so based on the fact that you do weddings and funerals and stuff, have you converted into a remote style of service offering? Um, you know, for a minute, I, I thought about doing like a paid live but i haven't completely transitioned i have um i'm kind of in the middle of working things out now to like maybe offer funeral services and um you know if a friend is having like a small gathering at their place um maybe i can tune in or dial in with zoom or you know, with a Google Me, something like that, a FaceTime. I think it's a good idea, actually. I mean, as, as morbid as it sounds, you know, um, there's a lot of funerals going on um, or not going on. And if anything, there are more memorial services and they're being done virtually. Uh, so I, I think it's a really good idea that you would offer the sounds of a live violin as a means of uh, just personalizing the occasion. Yeah, and unfortunately it is morbid, but, you know, the personalized occasion is what brings everyone together. And if your relative or loved one, you know, really loved uh, one specific song, cause there's always the music that brings everyone together. Um, so, you know, if you can remember something that they loved, recommend it to me and um, I'll play my best um, for in their honor, you know? That's beautiful. And so the other thing is, before we go, I know that they're also offering weddings virtually. I mean, I don't know how that's 
even be organized, but uh, the fact that you, you're a wedding uh, performer as well. Um, I mean, you're not just all available for these occasions. It's just that these happen to be the occasions that uh, pretty much this is the season for them. I, 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 I hate even talking about the funerals because it, I'm really impacted by the fact that people are transitioning without having their loved ones by their sides. Yeah. So I think the fact that you're able to offer this as a customized way of comforting um, is beautiful. Yeah, and that's what really gets people by. And I believe music, you know, is one of those keys that you need to really move on and um, any art, actually. But music really does help. Well, we're looking forward to getting a taste of it ourselves. So thank you for being here with us. No, thank you. All right, once again, you, all right, so you guys, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, but when we return, James is going to perform for us, so don't go anywhere. Everyone, welcome back to Open. It's now time for this week's Open Artist Spotlight. <laughs> Now to perform Besame Mucho in the style of Andrea Bocelli, please welcome violinist James Teal. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for that virtual social distancing violin kiss. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This was such an honor. Blessings to you. You guys, for more information on James and his services, be sure to visit his website at tealmusic.nyc. And uh, you can also find him on Instagram at James Teal Violin. That is our show today, mi gente. Thanks to all of our guests for coming through and to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you've missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recablecast tonight in 24 hours a day at BronxNet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin. And from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor. Stay Bronx strong, safe, and healthy. And, uh, bueno, happy Mother's Day, ladies. <laughs>